Welcome to Pupit's digital series. My name is Burcin Kolf, and if you take international finance at Pupit's summer school, I'll be your instructor. Just a little bit of background information on me. I did my PhD in finance at McGill University. Uh, I completed in um, 2012 and then joined PACE shortly afterwards. And ever since I had PACE, I taught corporate finance, international finance, financial management, as well as um, field study courses that involve um, visits to international businesses. In terms of research, uh, my research focuses on international corporate finance. Um, so I developed a research agenda that focuses on topics such as um, corporate governance, corporate social responsibility, uh, political risk, tax avoidance, and such. And I uh, look at these topics in the context of uh, cross-border mergers and acquisitions and see if they have any valuation impacts on multinational corporations. Uh, as far as Phoebus, I'm a recent member of the Phoebus family, and so far it's been a rewarding experience, I must say. Uh, first of all, I'm exposed to a diverse, dynamic, um, very international um, students, and also uh, I work with a professional team uh, that is extremely friendly, really helpful, and I get to spend a month in this amazing city, Berlin. Um, and because also the courses nature involve um, business visits, it um, helps expose us, um, both me and the students, to the uh, work culture as well as the fun culture in the city. And um, also Fubis, uh, in addition to the um, a re very rigorous academic curriculum, incorporates a lot of fun activities um, that helps us um, to meet uh, other people and explore uh, this amazing city and its um, surroundings in a very fun way. Um, yeah, so, um, so far, um, because I really enjoyed it, I look forward to um, the next years of teaching with Phoebus. Okay, so if you want to get more information on the programs they have, you can go to www.phoebus.org. There is actually um, a nice video there. Um, you can get information on the courses they offer, the programs, and um, everything that you would be interested in. Regarding our course, um, it's in, uh, a course that's offered on-site in summer, and it's a four European uh, credit course. The idea of the course is to introduce students to the global financial environment, but we do have a special focus on Europe and Eurozone. So uh, once we learn about um, sort of the theories, the main theories of international finance, we bring in um, sort of the Europe and Eurozone approach to it. We uh, provide the analytical, uh, the objective is to provide the analytical tools so that students can understand the international financial markets, as well as the forces um, that are driving them, such as the um, economic and institutional forces. So the concepts that we cover include um, those such as balance of payments, exchange rates, um, how they're determined, their relationships with the interest rates and inflation rates. So you can think of it as like a macroeconomics course that is applied to international financial markets and uh, Europe and Eurozone issues. So we do hold um, a lot of debates uh, that are current on Eurozone uh, crisis, for example, um, potential impact of Brexit, and so on and so forth. So while I do lecture, um, there's more than uh, just lecturing um, into my classes. So uh, you will see a glimpse of the lecture through these digital series, uh, but there is a lot of group work um, that's also involved. So you'll be assigned to groups and within the groups and as well as the across the groups, um, you will hold um, discussions and debates based on the assigned readings. So the readings will be based on um, the current topics and they will help you apply uh, the concepts learned in the class to um, basically ongoing issues and debates. Uh, for example, as I mentioned earlier, we'll have a debate on Brexit, whether it will benefit UK and Europe in the long run or not. Um, or, uh, for example, we cover uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, there we discuss whether a Bitcoin is overvalued or is it, um, is it really the future, um, so on and so forth. So it is, um, in that sense, um, very current um, and um, sort of interaction-wise, a very dynamic course. 
Also starting from uh, day three, we will also have the um, student presentations. Uh, it's, it's a group presentation. And as a group, students will pick a country and report the macroeconomics, trade relations, uh, exchange rate dynamics, uh, past currency crisis, if there are any, and the future outlooks uh, for that country. And again, this exercise is very helpful to apply what we learn in the class to uh, real life cases. Uh, we also get to learn a lot about other countries and their economies. And in the past, um, last year, basically, uh, we had students presenting, because we have a very diverse set of students, they presented um, their own country. And uh, for example, an Argentinian person presented Argentina. Um, there were also some Venezuelan students that gave us information that we couldn't even read in the news. So it's been uh, super interesting. And also one of the uh, most favorite aspects of the course, if you ask the students who take the course, they really enjoyed um, this um, sort of country presentations. We also have a number of uh, excursions and class visits. Uh, last year, we had visitors from Admiral uh, Markets Exchange Office, where they gave us the first time information on what it's like to be an exchange rate trader. Uh, and also, since Berlin positions itself as a, sort of a startup hub, uh, we have a lot of fintech uh, businesses that operate um, in Berlin. So we did uh, do an excursion uh, to one of the most popular ones called Raisin. Uh, and there, in addition to learning about uh, the company's operations and the job opportunities, uh, students get to conduct actually a real life case study uh, where the, uh, the company asks us um, sort of to do a case study on how they can extend their Europe operations into the US. So students um, were divided into two groups and there they brainstormed, discussed and prepared a presentation and presented their findings um, to the raising people, uh, talked about uh, the opportunities and how they can overcome the challenges and so on. So in this new marketplace. So it was really fun. Um, also, uh, we did some um, excursions to museums. You can see um, some pictures here. Um, the one on top is our raisin visit. The one below on the left is when Admiral Markets came into our classroom and on the right, uh, the Bode Museum. So we definitely use uh, Berlin as a learning tool. It's a very um, experimental and experiential um, learning style. All right, so that's our course in a nutshell. And now we're gonna, um, uh, go to our uh, digital lecture series on the European Monetary Union and the Euro. And hopefully this will give you um, a glimpse of uh, what the lecture, um, what a sort of a specific lecture looks like. But as I said uh, before, um, it's definitely not just this part. This is going to be the first part of the class and it will be followed by um, sort of student discussions and um, next year's actually I plan to implement a field trip to European Economic Policy Center so that we can um, have a Q&A session with them in terms of whatever we class in, uh, cover in the class and beyond so all right if you're ready um, we'll get started okay so before I want to um, before I go on to uh, European Monetary Union and the Euro, uh, I would like to um, establish the importance of exchange rate stability in Europe. Since World War II, uh, European currency exchange stability has been one of the most important objectives of the European policymakers. And there are two factors that account for this. First, um, European economies are uh, highly interdependent due to their geographic proximity and close trade relations. And second, they did have a long history of an exchange rate instability, which indeed lead to, uh, led to um, uh, social and economic instability afterwards. So one of the examples of that is the hyperinflation that happened in Germany um, after the First World War. Uh, what happened there was, uh, even before going into the uh, war, Germany was highly indebted. And um, the losing the war didn't help, unfortunately. So they did end up with a high uh, repatriation payments. So in order to uh, pay them off, they had to print money. 
So this uh, caused hyperinflation and a rapid depreciation of their currency. It was so horrible that even um, you know going through um, from home to supermarket, you would see prices change or the currency that the cash that you hold is no longer valid and so on. So hyperinflation is a very um, sort of catastrophic um, scenario. And uh, this eventually led to collapse of their currency. So that was one. And the other one was um, during Great Depression uh, in 1930s, the, uh, there was a widespread of unemployment. So uh, devaluations, actually, these competitive de devaluations became um, very common. So countries, uh, what are these competitive devaluations? Well, countries would devalue their currency, uh, thinking that they can boost exports and decrease the unemployment this way. But then it doesn't have any effect when um, the other country um, does that in retaliation or imposes some uh, tariffs or other trade barriers. Um, so this was kind of like a lose-lose situation and um, Europe had to find another um, solution um, to sort of avoid um, such destructive policies. So in that sense, um, in order to achieve the economic progression over the course of history, they made, they made some attempts of forming a, some sort of alliance or in other words, a trading bloc. So what came before EU? Let's take a look at the gradual process of economic and financial integration in Europe. In 1957, um, the European Economic Community was established through the Treaty of Rome. Uh, this was to promote trade and fostering growth among uh, the partners. Uh, it consists of six founding uh, members, the Benelux countries, so Belgium, Netherlands and Luxembourg, as well as France, Italy, West Germany. And then later it expanded to include countries like Denmark, Ireland, UK, Greece, Portugal, Spain, and so on. So uh, almost the um, sort of the early members of the EU. Um, and then in 1979, uh, they did establish what is called, the EC members established the European Monetary System in EMS. So this was basically, um, can, you can think of this as a precursor to the EMU, European Monetary Union. Uh, basically, it linked their, linked their currencies in order to prevent large fluctuations um, relative to one another, right? Uh, that was to promote a greater macroeconomic convergence between these countries. So. Uh, but we will talk about how this works um, in a bit. So, and then in 1985, they signed the Single European Act, which helped uh, to remove physical, technical, and fiscal barriers um, so that the trade can happen uh, with much less frictions between these member countries, as well as led to full uh, liberalization of the capital markets, uh, financial services, um, so the capital could move uh, freely across these nations. And uh, the uh, Single European Act actually paved the way and uh, created the conditions for the creation of the um, Maastricht Treaty, um, basically the European Union through the Maastricht Treaty, uh, which simply that treaty set a timetable for the adoption of a single currency, the euro, as we know, and the creation of the uh, European Monetary Union. All right, so let's, uh, before we move on to uh, EU and EMU, let's uh, take a closer look at this precursor uh, European monetary system, how it worked and what it tried to achieve and whether it was a um, sort of a good system or not. Let's, let's take a look. So you can think of European monetary system as a system of fixed but adjustable exchange rates. Uh, and they are based on um, central rates that are defined relative to what we call as European currency units. So European currency unit is different than Euro, meaning it's not a legal tender. Um, there, there are no banknotes or coins um, as an ECU, but uh, it, did, it was used as a unit of account as a, and as a means of settlement. Uh, it is, you can think of it as a basket of currencies, um, and then it will have the, uh, the 12 EEC uh, member countries' currencies, but it wouldn't have them in the same amount. So the quantity of each currency's influence 
is based on the relative strength of that economy. So in that sense, um, shortly afterwards, the Deutsche Mark at the time emerged as um, sort of um, a, the strongest currency among them uh, due to Bundesbank's uh, low inflation policies and um, other currencies basically had to uh, follow their lead. And this uh, kind of led to um, some dissatisfaction in most countries and it was one of the primary forces uh, why the EMS system um, fell apart and instead the euro was implemented. Because with euro, um, you're not anchoring um, a currency into um, to anything else. It's going to be a free floating currency, so as we're going to see in a bit. But um, so that was the idea. Um, and the at the heart of the system, you have this what we call as the exchange rate mechanism. So exchange rate mechanism is a system that basically um, is a mutually agreed on uh, parities, right, for each currency's equilibrium value. So there are equilibrium uh, values that the currency um, has to achieve, and the countries that are participating has to pledge to keep currencies within a fluctuating band around this equilibrium values. And if for one reason or another, that um, value, the band is exceeded, then central banks of those countries have to intervene in the markets uh, to bring um, the exchange rate back to where it's supposed to be. Um, and initially this bandwidth was 2.25%. Uh, and then for some countries, it was different for Italian Lira, Spanish Pezzetta, um, Portuguese Escudo and Greek Drachma. These were the currencies prior to Euro for those countries. Uh, that bandwidth was um, around 6%. As you can see, by the way, uh, these are the countries, we're going to talk about Eurozone crisis in a bit, but these are the countries, um, they just have a different dynamic um, in terms of their economies. Um, so they did have um, a sort of a more of a leeway in, in their currency dynamics as well. So uh, I want, I'm going to explain in a bit the latest uh, period of the system. Actually, this bandwidth was as large as uh, 15%. And we'll talk in a bit why. Okay. So did it work? Let's talk about the pros and cons of um, the ERM, the uh, or EM, uh, European Monetary System, this exchange rate mechanism. Well, <clears throat> the good thing is that it prepared the ground uh, for a monetary union, um, and then it did help to uh, stabilize the exchange rates, right? And then um, especially help the countries that were um, operating with high inflation um, so in terms of it kind of disciplined their economies in that sense. Uh, also helped what I just uh, described, the competitive devaluations uh, between these European nations. So uh, that um, really declined between years 79 and 95. So um, it was pretty helpful. So the strategy was um, sort of successful in that sense. Uh, but it did have um, some really dark days. So, for example, uh, Black Wednesday is one of them. In um, September 1992, uh, George Soros's quantum fund um, actually brought down um, UK pound. Um, Bank of England could no longer um, keep up. Uh, what they did was they did uh, bet against the UK pound and they short sell. Uh, pushed uh, Bank of England to the limits and then UK had to exit uh, the ERM system because they couldn't keep up. So um, that's why actually George Soros is also known as the guy who almost brought down uh, Bank of England. Uh, but yeah, so that was like uh, definitely a memorable day. Uh, in world finance, and um, in similar thing happened in 1993 uh, when there was a speculative attack, a serious speculative attack on uh, French francs. So uh, what happened was there was a Brussels compromise as a result. So in 1993, the bandwidth was, ex because of that, was um, expanded to uh, 15 plus minus 15%. So that was... Um, Okay, so then uh, basically these kind of events show that the foreign exchange intervention that is not supported by the changes in countries' monetary policy has indeed had uh, limited 
effect on the exchange rates. And there were also issues of the government credibility and effective coordination of policies. So um, those um, kind of limitations um, sort of became obvious after these events. Which kind of led um, to um, another solution, right? So in order to um, deal with that, they moved uh, from that system into a, a more a unified system with a single currency of the Europe, uh, the Euro. Okay, so Maastricht Treaty um, in December 1991, members of the European Union met at Maastricht, Netherlands, and they finalized a treaty that would change Europe's currency uh, future from then on. And this treaty set a timetable uh, so that they would um, replace each individual ECU currencies with a single currency called the Euro. Okay, so um, who can uh, join? So they made a convergence criteria uh, so that uh, each member country had to comply uh, with certain standards and have to manage these certain standards even after joining to uh, EMU. So that would uh, be on uh, based on the nominal inflation rates, long-term interest rates, fiscal deficits, and government debt. So let's see, who can join? Well, first of all, uh, the country has to have a price stability. So a rate of inflation within uh, 1.5 percentage points of three best performing EU countries is required. Okay, so um, for the long-term interest, it has to be within two percentage points of the three lowest rates, okay? So low interest rates, low inflation, uh, they need exchange rate stability. So for that, they somehow kept the ERM system as um, a sort of like um, a disciplining tool. It's called ERM2 in the, in the Euro um, uh, era. So uh, for at least two years, the country has to keep within the normal fluctuation margins of this um, ERM2 system. And the uh, bandwidth there remained as uh, plus minus 15%. Uh, for, they also wanted a sustainable government uh, financial position, so they require a budget deficit that is no longer, uh, no higher than 3% uh, of the GDP, and a ratio of public debts uh, to GDP should not be uh, more than 60%. Okay, so any country, uh, any EU country that uh, can satisfy these conditions uh, would be eligible to join uh, and adopt Euro, to join the EMU and adopt Euro. What else? So East, uh, European Central Bank is the, um, it's very central, uh, very essential um, to the system. So they are the independent central bank um, that dominates the activities of the individual country's central bank. So they are over, ECB is over and above um, EMU member countries' um, own central banks. Uh, structure and functions were modeled after German's Bundesbank, which was initially a model from uh, after US Fed. Uh, but the most important mandate here is uh, for ECB is to promote the price stability uh, within the EU. Okay, so that's why it is um, there. And on January 4th, 1999, the euro was officially launched and replaced the individual currency. So we no longer see uh, Italian liras, right? Spanish pesetas. So it's it's now um, all euro when we travel to Europe. So who are the initial adopters? Austria, again, the Benelux countries, right? Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg. We have also uh, Finland, France, Germany, Ireland, Italy, uh, Portugal, and Spain. They were the original 11 participating countries. Even though UK, Sweden, and Denmark were part of the EU, they decided to opt out. They wanted to uh, maintain their individual currencies. Uh, here is actually a great um, table where um, you can see on the y-axis the um, countries. And on the x-axis, you can see uh, the years. So you, the, as far as the color codes, 
Uh, dark blue stands for um, the euro adoption. The light blue is the uh, ERM mechanism, exchange rate mechanism prior to that. And then uh, for the uh, orangey yellow uh, color, it's uh, basically a floating currency and uh, the green is basically some sort of anchoring, in other words, pegging um, to um, ECU um, or, or Euro or something. So uh, as we can see, uh, the Benelux countries, France, Germany, Ireland, uh, almost Italy, uh, except for some period of time of floating, um, they joined, um, and Austria, I think. Yeah. So they basically, um, right after ERM, um, joined Euro. Uh, Denmark uh, kept uh, ERM system in, in force, so they didn't join Euro, but they still uh, follow certain um, sort of discipline uh, to achieve that macroeconomic convergence uh, that helps achieve that macroeconomic convergence. Uh, but then you have countries like UK, Sweden, um, that just let their currencies uh, free floating, except for UK, at some point they joined the ERM and then they decided to leave. Um, so as you can see, um, again, very similar histories um, happening here uh, pr pr uh, prior to EU. And then, um, then we have um, Greece, right, floating and then pegging and then ERM and EU, Euro. So it's basically um, uh, some sort of a transition. Uh, Spain, uh, Portugal, uh, similar, even though they adopted Euro much uh, before Greece. And then, yeah, so we had after those 11 members, then um, Greece, Slovenia, Cyprus, uh, Malta, Slovakia, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, the Baltic nations, they all joined um, Euro in the recent years. So uh, we still have the EU members that haven't joined um, EMU yet. They are part of EU, but not EMU. So Hungary, Poland, Czech Republic, Bulgaria, Romania, and Croatia. Among these, uh, who is more likely to join? As of now, uh, Czech Republic, uh, Poland, and Hungary don't have any uh, intention or any rigorous plan to join. Uh, but the most hopeful ones that are trying to join are uh, what we call as Europe's uh, poorest, uh, Bulgaria, Romania, and Croatia. You, you can see the wealth gap. Um, it's basically, uh, based on the 2017 numbers, but you can see how uh, the GDP per capita in Bulgaria is around uh, 8K in 2017, Romania is around almost close to 11K, Croatia is 13K. These are far below the Euro area average of 38K um, GDP per capita. So, um, and then they also have to um, sort of resolve their structural problems, some institutional weaknesses and uh, prepare the economic conditions um, they have to be significantly improved um, before uh, the Eurozone accession. So uh, let's see, we're still hopeful, right? So I don't know why uh, the slides are not moving, but I'm just gonna go in with this. Okay, so uh, given the size of the Euro area, uh, we should note that the Euro plays a very, inter a very important international um, role um, as this uh, major currency. It's a major reserve currency. Um, it's uh, basically a lot of foreign financial authorities hold a Euro, a lot of uh, foreign central banks. It's also part of the uh, special drawing rights of um, IMF. Uh, it's a trade invoicing currency. A lot of trade takes place in euro denominated term. Um, there's a big debt market. A lot of countries issue debts denominated in euros or companies. So um, there's a big um, financial market for that. And also um, there, are, there are big markets that have um, assets traded in euro denomination. So it is a, offers a great portfolio diversification um, currency for a portfolio diversification. So uh, is it an attractive alternative to the US dollar? So let's see how um, the euro did relative to US dollar. Uh, since its launch, it basically, uh, right after um, its launch, um, there was a sort of a, a decline in euro's value, and that was uh, because of the actually strength in uh, strong US economy. Um, then 
there was the sluggish economic sectors and happening in the EMU countries. So that's why there was a bit of a decline. But beginning in 2002, um, Euro was on the rise and that was uh, that peaked in summer of 2008. This was mostly due to uh, the general weakening of the um, US economy because they had a high uh, BOP, the balance of payment deficit, uh, but also European economies were um, sort of doing relatively better. And, uh, but since 2008, uh, which led to the Eurozone crisis as well, um, it sort of uh, has been coming roughly downward and um, against the dollar and demonstrated quite a bit of volatility. And as you can see in 2014, um, sort of a repeating Eurozone crisis, um, there's also been um, a big decline in Euro's value relative to dollar. So, uh, but we'll see. Uh, right now it seems like the, um, the you know, the, at least the direction has turned up again and we'll see what happens uh, in the upcoming years on Maybe it's like whoever comes out of stronger uh, from the current crisis um, is going to determine that. What were the reasons to adopt euro? Uh, first of all, currency exchange is costly. Uh, when you exchange currencies, you probably notice that the there's a buy number and there's a sell number, right? So there's a commission um, that um, these currency traders make. So just from the exchange. So um, they thought that, you know, if you eliminate the currency uh, differences, differentials, then the currency, these um, sort of transaction costs are going to be eliminated vastly. The estimated savings were up to one percentage point of annual European GDP. So 13 to 20 billion euros uh, for that. Also, they thought it would be um, lower uh, sort of adopting Euro um, should ideally, right, uh, lower um, the cost created by competition. So um, also that because there is a single currency, um, now you can do easier price comparisons and that should stimulate competition and that would benefit the consumers. Uh, it will also help eliminate the exchange rate risk. Now, uh, these countries don't have to worry about what the exchange rate is going to be because they all use euro, right? So that risk is completely eliminated. Uh, more favorable trading and investment environment for those businesses. Uh, yeah, so the idea was basically to encourage more efficient integrated markets that add greater liquidity and lower uh, cost for the borrowers. If you look at the opponents of the euro, um, you know, they basically argue that the transaction costs on foreign exchange transactions are small. Um, they don't think there's a conclusive evidence that volatility of exchange rate has a negative impact on trade. If anything, it shouldn't affect it. Um, and obviously, there are big costs associated with adopting euro. Number one, and the most important one of all, is that the country is actually giving up its right to set interest rates. Okay, so they're basically surrounding their monetary policy um, to ECB, right? So then the country on its own cannot stimulate its economy using monetary policy. And they cannot move exchange rates against each other to boost exports, for example, uh, like they used to do before. So, um, so those, that tool they completely um, lose out on. Um, but as of January 1st, right, 1999, only European Central Bank can create money, okay? So they are the, um, the center of the monetary policy, right? So the introduction of the single currency means by definition, there's going to be a single monetary policy for the EMU nations, right? Uh, so it won't be individual, it will be all an EMU uh, monetary policy, uh, whereas fiscal policies will remain responsibility of the national governments. So member uh, states are free to choose as long as uh, these policies are sustainable and responsible. Uh, of course, when countries um, have to forego the monetary policy, the only way they can stimulate their economy would be through fiscal policy. So it was expected that this would result in excess budget deficits. So they did try to prohibit it by the Treaty and Stability and Growth Pact signed by those member states. Um, and the gov because the government member of these member countries, they can issue bonds in euros, right? So they can issue euro denominated bonds, but they cannot print the money to service that debt, right? So the investors 
have to believe in their credit worthiness to be able to pay it back somehow, right? For through their strong economy, hopefully. Uh, so what happens in the the impact of this is that the even though at the short term money market the um, interest rates are more or less similar. Uh, in long-term interest rates, um, they differ quite a bit. So countries have very different, uh, EMU countries have very different um, sort of yields on their um, treasury bonds. So uh, a system of preventive actions and fines has been laid out to prevent these budgetary problems. But as we've seen with all the Eurozone crisis and so on, in practice, none of those worked. So it seemed like they knew what was coming, what could happen, obviously, when they were setting out these rules. Uh, but in the end, whatever they were scared of um, ended up coming out. So this is a great uh, time to link this to one of the most important um, theories in international finance. It's called um, impossible trinity. It basically, um, refers to the fact that a country has to give up uh, one of the three goals described by the sides of this um, triangle, uh, monetary independence, exchange rate stability, or full financial integration. Um, the force of economics just do not allow the simultaneous achievement of all three. Okay, so if we look at the uh, United States and Japan, um, they have uh, full monetary independence and financial integration, but they, um, don't have fixed exchange rates, so the exchange rate stability is not there. Uh, for the um, during Bretton Woods and what China has been um, in the past is basically keeping some sort of um, a sort of a peg rate, right? So the exchange rate stability is there, and they do have the monetary independence, but then they would have to restrict um, sort of the capital flows, right? So they have to forego the free flow of capital. And um, where Euro stands is actually in the point B, where they have the exchange rate stability with um, adopting of Euro and then uh, the full financial integration, but they do have to give up the monetary independence. Okay, so they don't have uh, independent monetary policy anymore. Um, so as we could see um, how this, in eventually led to the Eurozone crisis. Uh, what basically happened there was um, in order to stimulate their economy uh, and borrowing cheaper because they adopted Euro, uh, even though their economies are uh, significantly different, right? They were all borrowing in Euros. Um, at some point, as we said, it's okay up until creditors are willing to lend. But when 2008 financial crisis hit the U.S., the credit tightened in the world markets and um, investors started looking at Europe and started getting really concerned because they believed that um, most of these countries were um, sort of um, over uh, had overly um, uh, indebted themselves and um, they don't have the means to pay it back. So... You can see in this graph on the left uh, how uh, Greece and Italy uh, sort of operating with that as a person, you know, higher than the GDP, um, as well as, you know, Ireland, uh, Spain, Portugal, even, even Britain, right, had um, really high um, sort of sovereign debt. So um, as you can see on the chart on the right hand side, these are the yields that are uh, the, the government bond spreads, 10 year bond spreads. You can think of the interest rates on these bonds um, relative to the German ones. Um, be prior to 2008, they're just like uh, obviously less than 1% below. But, um, you know, in 2009, they really shoot up, right? Um, so Greece was the, the first one, but then it just kind of like had the um, domino effect on affecting um, all sort of countries in a similar situation uh, and then led to uh, a devastating Eurozone crisis in 2009, which, uh, you know, basically the uh, sort of more robust economies in the EU had to step in and uh, bail out um, these nations. Uh, this is where actually we bring in our um, debate, the class discussion. Uh, we do uh, do some readings prior and then um, in, within the class we discuss whether um, does austerity work or does it make um, things worse for Europe. 
uh, sort of in this context, we try to answer questions are such as what are the reasons behind the austerity policy, right? So because um, obviously these bailouts came with the um, austerity measures, right? Um, they had to discipline themselves, these countries, um, which was devastating initially for their economies, um, but uh, we, we in this sort of in this context, uh, after this many years, uh, we sort of discuss um, first of all what was the reason? Why did they have to um, adopt these policies? Uh, were there any detrimental effects? Were there any benefits? Right? Or overall, did they really help um, solve the uh, macroeconomic issues in the eurozone so far? So uh, this is something um, like a really nice discussion that we have. Um, after this conversation. And uh, that brings us uh, to the uh, sort of a discussion on the future of the Eurozone. Uh, we discussed basically after this, what's evading Eurozone next. Um, there's a nice article that looks at the contemporary issues. Um, as we know now, the Brexit is a big issue. Um, so we do have a lot of readings and discussions on that. Um, and now the coronavirus, right? So they just passed a, a really big bill, 70, 750 billion uh, bailout program, and who knows uh, what's coming afterwards, right? So um, that could be our, that's probably gonna be our next debate. Uh, and still many, many challenges ahead of the Eurozone, just like the rest of the world economy. So, um, but yeah, so this is um, basically what our course really, um, uh, you know, touches upon and discusses. So I hope you uh, enjoyed just a glimpse of the lecture of what, it's, uh, what it is like, uh, what kind of topics we talk about and how we talk about it, um, sort of how we bring in the, the discussion parts and so on at the end of um, sort of learning some sort of concepts. Um, and if you uh, hope you enjoyed this digital lecture series um, and then hopefully uh, you will join us in Fubis. If you have any questions, uh, please contact me. Uh, here's my email. You can also find Pubis on social media. And um, if you have any questions about the program, please uh, feel free to email the Pubis team. Um, they're an excellent team and they'll be uh, responding to right away. Um, so yeah, so I hope to uh, meet you in person uh, in the next years. So yeah, bye for now.